I want to go right back. Yes. I want to talk about early Vancouver. Yes. I want to talk about your very beginning. Yes. I'm interested because you were a teenager here in Vancouver during the Second World War. I was an evacuee from from Glasgow, from Scotland. So you spent the war years here in Vancouver? Uh, yes, we came in the second year of the war, my mother and I. What was Vancouver like in 1942, 43, 44, 45? When you said that, I thought of the first play I did here it was for the Vancouver Little Theatre and it was Bunty Pulls the Strings and it was broad Scottish. I had a broad Scottish accent at the time. So I got this part of this, this little girl in, in all this in Bunty Pulls the Strings and the opening night was Pearl Harbor. And there was a blackout here. And the thing was, did we go? Would anyone turn up? Because there were no lights for driving across and you couldn't turn the lights, the car lights on. But, you know, we got in the car and we got in somebody's car and we went over to the East End where the Vancouver Little Theatre was. And everybody was there, the cast was there and the audience was there and they'd come from Victoria to see it. And, and? and we did it. When you say, what was it like to you? <laughs> well, it was full of I remember memory. that. I just remember that. I, I, I did this. I had, was taking elocution again, as I did in Glasgow, from a, a, a Anne Mossman here, and her brother was playing the lead in Bunty Pulls the Strings, and I was playing this. And, and, and so there was no difference. It was, uh, I mean, they expected this coast to be bombed. And in terms of Navy personnel or food shortages or none of that or well we'd come from Scotland where we you know we were and when we crossed Canada um, we thought we came back to Canada because my father's pensions came from Canada he was in the Canadian army and he was a, a minister in the United Church and those two pensions are what we lived on and uh, so my mother decided for two reasons, one the monetary reason, but also there, if she stayed in Scotland, her life was done. She was a widow, she'd wear a black armband the rest of her life and that her, her life was over. So she wasn't going to have that happen, so she came back to Canada where they had been happiest. And, and she had a sister in Vancouver, so we crossed the country. As we crossed the country, the Stirling area closed behind us. We never saw any of the pensions or any of my the savings. Uh, until the war was over, well, l long after the war was over. When you say sterling area, you mean the pound sterling? Yeah, pearls, pound no sterling. No pounds left Britain, therefore your pensions That's right. didn't come. And, and the pensions went into Scotland and stayed there. And uh, so we arrived in Vancouver uh, on the seven uh, pounds that we were allowed each. Managed to get across the country and here, and then my mother went to work as a nurse for somebody, somebody in somebody's office, and I had a paper route, and we managed. It was, it was harder than uh, if we'd stayed where we were. And was it blackouts? Yeah. And my mother knew all about that, you see. Well, not the way we had in Scotland, but, but she knew that, and she became part of the, what was it called? The VIP. Vancouver. It was it was the people who would tell the people what to do when we were bombed, and she knew because she'd been on the street in in Glasgow, so she knew what to do. You had it, it, it when I remember reading what I had to do. You had to you had to take uh, when if there was a bomb there, you had you had to take a, a blanket or a sheet like this and approach the bomb and throw it over the bomb, shovel sand on it. Wouldn't have done any good, but we didn't have any bombs. Anyway. Vancouver and the Japanese Canadian population oh, and dreadful. Pearl Harbor. Did, what did you, do, as a young oh, Glaswegian Canadian, how how did you feel, see that? Well, we didn't we didn't know. Uh, I was in uh, I was at Kitsilano High School, and uh, one day we went to school and there were empty seats. Nobody who told us what had happened. It was ages before we knew that it was because we never thought of them as being Japanese. They were people we went to school with, and they were taken into the interior, you know, and we learned about that much later when everybody else did. VE Day, what happened to VE Day in the... I was going to an elocution lesson, 
And, and I remember, think I can see exactly where I was. I was walking towards the house where I went for my lesson. And I remember thinking, today is so important that I'm amazed that the color of the sky hasn't changed and the color of the earth hasn't changed. You know, like first time you cross a border, <laughs> a major border into um, France or Switzerland or something, you, you expect the earth to change color. I remember thinking that, that there should be some phenomenal sight that says the world has changed. That's all I remember is just that one thing. And just point of curiosity, what about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Were you aware of the, the end of the Japanese war, the war in Japan and the atom bomb? Or was yes, that just yes, part of a yes. teenager's periphery? No, no, no. That was, no, that was our... That was our... Um, 9-11. The opposite of a light 9-11. For us. Dreadful thing. Dreadful. How would you I don't know where I was for that, though. I don't remember where I was. And I don't remember who I talked to about it, but I know we did. I know it was a dreadful way. But the word was, some, we dropped an atom bomb, or a major new weapon, or... The Americans did. It's typically Canadian, I think. Say, well, it wasn't us that did it. It wasn't me. With Canadian uranium from Saskatchewan? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's very hard. No, I don't, I don't remember. I remember keeping my feet on the road I was on, the thrilling road I was on as far as the, the theatre and going to summer school of the theatre and going to classes at UBC and stuff and keeping myself there, not safe exactly, but where do you go? You go, you go deeper and you go to what you know is good. <laughs> but um, no, I don't have the same, you obviously have much clearer memory. Well, it was, you know, I was, well, I wasn't born at the time, but... <laughs> you weren't born, you know, but, but in thinking about it and thinking, thinking, if I'd what, been there, yeah. Yeah, what impact would that made on well, an ordinary we didn't teenager? Know. See, we didn't know things the way we do now instantly. We didn't know till long after, really. Um, do you remember anything about the, again, total pure personal curiosity here? As, as the Japanese, Canadi Japanese Canadians returned from the internment camps back to Vancouver, was, would one be aware of any of that? living in Vancouver at the time? In very personal terms, they were our friends, they were, you know, and they went and, and the, the terrible impact for me was much later when I realized that their art had just been wiped out. I mean, I found, do you remember Alan Barlow? I remember Alan Barlow finding a, a fabulous, he, he, he would, he could, cross a street in Montreal and pass a shop and get a vibration of something that was in that shop and get off on the next stop and go back and say, uh, show me that W that you've got in the win window, what do you think it is? And it would turn out to be a medieval letter from a medieval alphabet, you know. And he found some Japanese work that had been taken and sold and appeared in Montreal in somebody's uh, shop. He had a, an exquisite thing and was aching, uh, uh, achingly sad about it, but he was looking after it. It was a very fragile thing. It was a, a woman playing a, a pipe. Alan Barlow just uh, is, is, was a designer, right? yes. a theatre designer. I, I do want to point out, just because you're sitting here, the other, one other piece of brilliance in that year of theatre school that you ran that I was in, the, one of the other most fruitful exercises was you chose Alan Barlow, a designer, to direct a second year exercise of Country Wife? No, I can't remember, it was Restoration. And you had him as a designer direct us acting students. 
And what he gave me as a designer, he opened the door in the 18th century for me, not through a history point of view, but through aesthetics. And I blessed you for the rest of my life well, because his, his uh, combination of aesthetics in terms of costume, of hair, of makeup, of, of snuff, of this, of that, opened a period to me that could not have been opened any other way. And he was keeping me alive through your Greek exercise because we were talking, he was incredible on the Greeks. He would say when it came to chorus, that the, the basis of chorus was hysteria that you had to tap the well of hysteria in order to get a chorus piece there. Um, I, I remember him using the word and being startled. And I know now that you're bringing it up that he was there for me when I first went there and that he was feeding me. Uh, we were talking about doing I think he was the one that encouraged me to do it. Yeah, great man. Dear man, marvelous artist.